I want to end our this session on uh, this the MSI and the, the data that's come out. So just very recently, uh, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for any MSI high solid tumor. Um, and I want to, obviously this has really its foundations in the MSI high colon space. Um, and um, Dirk, why don't I start with you, pick on you for this to, you know, tell us a little bit about MSI and colon cancer, frequencies, inherited. You want to get a little broad overview and then we'll talk about how to figure this out. Well, yeah, MSI is a, is a molecular marker, which you do know one of the, let's say, pathognomonic ways colorectal cancer exists or colorectal cancer de develops. Um, it's the minority of patients which follow this and um, in, we'd say, in locally advanced colorectal cancer, the rate of MSI positive patient or MSI high patient is, yeah, I would just say, between 8 and 12 percent. In metastatic, it's even uh, less. Yeah, so it's a small proportion of patients which are characterized by the mechanism that they bear many mutations in their genome. And these many mutations are really a high number of mutations which make them let's say, kind of successful for um, checkpoint inhibitors. And therefore, this MSI status stands for hypermutation, maybe not one by one, the correlation. And this stands for higher eff or for any efficacy of these checkpoint inhibitors, namely with pembrolizumab with a PD-1 uh, inhibitor. So it's not very common, but we're going to, we've already said we would know it in all our patients. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things. Um, I will postpone any discussion about rebiopsy, but I do mm -hmm. think there is some evidence that this might change over time, believe it or not, mm -hmm. um, which should play into the next question. Yeah, but, so, but I think that's mm -hmm. relevant because it's mm -hmm. not, frankly, it's not just MSI. It's mm -hmm. the tumor mutational burden. Mm -hmm. and, change, yeah. and some patients actually who may be MSI mm -hmm. indeterminate right. or, or, or low you, and their tumor, tumor mutational burden is high, We've used actually some of these agents. So let me pick on you. So yeah. other ways to measure. We talked about immunohistochemistry, looking for the four proteins. Um, you're kind of hinting at tumor mutational load. So genomic profiling, right. essentially, you know, next generation sequencing. And, and now I think most of the major testers, the companies, present to you. They do now. PDL1, right. MSI, TML. Um, th so each of these is is different, and I will actually share with you that they do not overlap. So you can have some tumors that are PD-1 positive and not TML yeah. high and the like. So as we learn, we'll hopefully figure out who are the ones yeah, that are PD-1 staining is probably the least useful. For colon cancer. For colon cancer. Yeah. Well, and other cancers well, perhaps. Lung cancer, I think it's a staple in some borderline way. Borderline in some ways. Yeah. Because there are still some PD-1 negative patients that do benefit, not as much. And uh, TML seems to correlate very, in colon, I will just share with you, correlates very nicely with, with MSI. MSI. Yes. Um, almost overlapping Venn diagrams. Absolutely. Fortunato, mm -hmm. you got a patient, metastatic colon, frontline, mm -hmm. MSI high. And you have access to, they'll send you the drug before the approval in mm -hmm. Europe. What are you going to do? Uh, actually, the answer is that we are lucky because we are the only center in Italy participating to the pembrolizumab mm. versus chemotherapy oh. uh, yeah, trial. Uh, trial in first line. So yeah. for me, it will be easy because I <laughs> will enroll the patient <laughs> in this trial that will be treated either in first line or in second line according to the trial with pembrolizumab. That is the only way and actually the only motivation for the patient to be tested because he hopes that in this way he will get pembrolizumab either in first or in second line. Yeah. And this trial, I guess, will be that very study important. has a crossover in it, too. It has a crossover. Yeah. It will be very important also because who knows if it's better to do chemo before yeah. or, and then. You know, right. this trial will be much more relevant than we think now because we'll place when to use uh, uh, the PD-1 inhibition in, uh, in uh, the continual care of these patients. It really becomes a very important study because yeah. our patients are going to knock on our doors and yeah. say, but wait, I, I want yeah. that yeah. drug. Um, and we're going to say we don't know. So the maybe answer. this trial is even more relevant now after FDA approval, hmm. because it will give a, a real answer when to use it. So y yeah, yes, I, I agree. But you know, besides the clinical trial, so when I think about say the last year I've been using this uh, in, in in practice, I've actually moved it now to first line when they're not they're not willing to go on the trial and. And, and the reason is very simple. Although these are 20 to 30 percent of the patients, although more in the refractory setting, but the responses you see for those patients who respond, the responses you see are dramatic and longer lasting than any chemotherapy that I, I wish to use in those patients. 
Uh, and I've actually had patients who were incredibly symptomatic from those, from those tumors that within two weeks, symptoms start resolving. Mm -hmm. Very, very dramatic effects. So the you thought, do really see a Lazarus effect. We all have you stories do. now yes. of yeah. patients who That's why I like to in take the refractory it, I like to take it to the first line, yeah. give it a quick shot, and then pending the study, and I hope the study confirms that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, you know, uh, <laughs> I still am not thinking I'm harming patients. Yeah. I think I'm benefiting them in many ways because they still have access to chemo at some point. I know, this Anybody is the reason why in first line lung cancer patients uh, is the same situation. If right. it's very high PDL1 expression, it's yeah. really much better to try PD1 PD1 yeah. inhibition yeah. and then to use chemo after because and so maybe there will be the same situation. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why the trial will be important. Yeah. Yeah. Difference yeah. of absolutely. opinion on this side of the table? No, not at all. And I'm particularly impressed with some of the chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab right. responses. And I, 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 I haven't been doing this nearly as long as you, John, but mm -hmm. in my almost 20 years, the, the, the most amazing response I've ever seen came on our, our trial, which was my colleague Safi Shada led, and yep. uh, there, he has an abstract this year at, at the ASCO meeting about uh, really an unbelievable response in a patient with Lynch syndrome, 27-year-old mm. woman. Any difference the response between Lynch's and acquired? No, we don't know. We don't know. We so don't know. The, there there don't was know. a nice paper this year at it ASCO. said they looked the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it actually suggested that in the metastatic setting, they, the, the patients who have uh, hereditary Lynch syndrome do better on yeah. average. They look better, but I, I agree. I think that the answer we just don't well, know for I, sure. Well, I'm not sure that it's the PD-1 as much as their disease tends to be a little bit more smoldering, uh, less aggressive. Right, and this was yeah. this was the point of the yeah. abstract, which I think came out of the the Dutch group. And their disease is less ag less aggressive. We won't deal with these patients. Mm -hmm. They tend to have less aggressive disease. And a really subtle point to this is that MSIs with BRAF mutations. One, they're not right. inherited. We, right. we pretty much know that, and we need to pull out that subgroup mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. as well. So we start to have, even within this small subgroup, some mm -hmm. variation mm -hmm. uh, there. One of the lessons for our group listening in is that if, because this is relatively new, if you do not know the MSI status on your metastatic colon patient, you need to know it, right? You send it off, and yeah. in that, would this be something and everyone in the room would biopsy a patient if you didn't know where the, if you didn't have tumor, you'd yes. go biopsy yes. some? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is worth Because it's an important opportunity yeah. for the patient. Yeah. 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 Everybody agrees? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, just one other comment from a clinical perspective, and, and I'm certainly not an expert in the PD-1 inhibitors, and at this table there are much more expertise than me, but we, we formed a, a working group across the cancer center to uh, standardize our practice with respect to managing toxicities, mm. which I, you know, I feel I still don't have a full understanding mm. of. And again, you all may have a much more sophisticated understanding, but those toxicities are not what we're used to, right? Yeah. And recognizing uh, when they come up and how to manage them, uh, there are lots of opportunities, I think. And there. they get even worse when you start introducing the CTLA-4 inhibitors with oh, yeah. the PD-1 yes. inhibitors. Well, and if Indeed. you combine them with chemo, you can't give steroids as any right. <laughs> So, So now you have more non-trade-offs. Yeah. Many, many uh, problems. Uh, yeah. It does. It's not simple, and we no, want to learn to be better mm -hmm. docs uh, around that and managing the toxicity. I've noticed even our uh, inpatient sort of hospitalist core uh, in the ICU team, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have to meet regularly to talk about management of these toxicities because on some level, yeah. you, when they get admitted and they're really sick, you know, how much steroid, yeah. if you're going to use it or not, and so it's created an awareness across mm -hmm. our uh, colleagues yeah. as well.